Well, good evening and welcome to our service here tonight at the Tron Kelvin Grove. It's great to have you with us this evening as we gather, gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus to worship and praise his name. So let's begin with our first hymn. It's on the screens. God, we praise you. God, we bless you. God, we name you Sovereign Lord. Let's sing together. let's pray shall we let's pray to our father in heaven father god in heaven we praise you this evening we bless you our sovereign lord father with the words we've just sung be more than just words on our lips but truths that we live by and for lord will you help us to know with certainty that through Jesus, through his death on the cross, sin is defeated, hell is confronted, heaven is opened to believers. Help us to live in the here and now in light of those eternal realities. Would you wake us up 
to your matchless beauty. Keep us from turning to lesser glories that we be captivated by your great and eternal gospel of hope. Lord, where our hearts have grown dim, fan them into flame. Where our vigor has been worn down through affliction, perhaps circumstance upon circumstance has overwhelmed us, worn us down. Would you bring fresh blessing, renewed desire, to drink deeply from your words, a real delight in serving you, our Lord and Savior, for you are good and you do good. So, Father, please, would you draw near to each of us this evening? Help us, whatever state we've arrived in, would we truly meet you in your word and go from here, eager to serve you in this, your world. So help us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a uh, very warm welcome again to you this evening, and uh, particularly if you've been away on the release of the Word Weekend, it's great to have you with us. Do stay awake uh, through the duration of the evening. It's great to have you back, and uh, great to have you with us. And if you've not been here before, if it's your first time, then you're particularly welcome, and we'd love to have a bit of time to chat with you at the end. There's tea and coffee served, and we'd like to have a bit of time to chat and get to know you. So please do stay on at the end. It'd be great to have some time with you. If you weren't here this morning, uh, do grab one of the notice sheets. Uh, you'll find them at the back. It details all that's happening in the life of the church this week. I'm not mentioning any of those things, but do grab one and have a look for yourself and see uh, what's uh, going on this week in the life uh, of our church. But let's turn again to our, I was going to say hymn books, but it's all on the screens tonight. So we turn to the screens uh, and our next uh, hymn on the screens in days long ago, through the prophets of old, and Andrew heard, this is another Willie Hem, <laughs> just for your enjoyment. So let's sing together. Thank you. 
Very good. Well sung. Well, I'd like to invite uh, Willie, who's going to come and interview Andrew Hurd, who's with us this week, and uh, hear a bit more about his work in Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, welcome back, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, most, can, can you translate, I've never sung a song with the word bon in it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that? Mean? When Luca comes to Scotland, it means beautiful. Yeah. No. No, it means beautiful. Yeah. The beautiful, better glory of Jesus. It's, uh, <laughs> because it didn't rain. Because it fits, it fits our culture. <laughs> Right, will you get back on script, please? Um, <laughs> most of you here uh, were here this morning, I think, uh, good, most of you anyway, and uh, heard Andrew preaching. Some of you were with us on uh, Friday evening and Saturday uh, for the Western Scotland Gospel Partnership Conference. Andrew's with us uh, to do a number of things. That conference is here to help us uh, as a church leadership as we think through our way of uh, organizing our church here and he's here to to meet with other ministers as well next week and uh, you've come a long way to do that Andrew but it's something you feel uh, you feel is worth doing and you feel quite passionately about helping churches organize themselves better for their gospel ministry yes good one of the things that uh, several people have said to me uh, after the conference Friday Saturday was that they, they loved your illustration of the uh, of the archery and the target so do you want to share that with uh, with us for everybody else's benefit tell us what you were talking about why, why you were using that sure uh, well um, great to be with you uh, I've really enjoyed my time with you um, yeah look one of the uh, gee, I feel like I need to give more um, God sent his son to die for his world he loves his world so much and there's so much at stake with heaven and hell. Um, it matters so much that people come and find forgiveness in Christ, that, that he came to rescue us. Um, so I'm passionate about seeing churches embrace that truth, recognise the realities that are, there's such great things at stake, such dreadful things at stake, such wonderful things at stake. That we, that we actually uh, mobilise to make the most of the few years that the Lord has given us here. And one of the things I see often in churches is that we, um, we just do church. We just come and we turn the wheels of church and we just do what we've always done. And if we do anything, we aren't really focused on whether it's going to make a difference or not. We just do what we've been doing. And I've likened it to uh, the way people do archery in that um, ordinarily when you do archery, you will not actually, I've never fired an arrow in my life, but anyway, it's not hard to work out. I've watched the movies. You, when you do archery, you, you put a target on the wall and you try and hit it. And if you miss, you try a bit harder until you can hit it. Churches, when they do archery, they shoot the arrow and wherever it lands, they draw the target and they go, success. <laughs> and it's a, it, when you do a ministry in church life, when you run church, people often just run it, and whatever happens, they go, well, that's what we're aiming for, and hasn't it been wonderful? Instead of trying to work out what should we be trying to achieve as a church, where should be we going, and let's try and actually go there. Now, the good way of, the best thing about doing archery with just drawing the target later is you can never miss. So it is a nice way to do church life because you can never get it wrong. But there's so much at stake. It matters so much that we see disciples made. Let's be more deliberate and intentional and try and do that better. And the way to do that better is to work out what we're trying to do and organise ourselves to get there. So yeah, that's really helpful. Can, I, can we put up that slide there? We, we talked recently in our, uh, in our church about trying to... Uh, work out what we're trying to do the different things that are part of church life and we've we've uh, we've, we've used the acronym of the word worship because we think it's helpful because it reminds us that to worship god is to not just sing songs or even just come to church but it's to do all of these things we want to see our city evangelized through witness we want to be uh, committed and have people edified for obedience to christ we want our congregations engaging in renewal through the word and prayer we want to be uh, sharing together in the body of christ we want to 
want to be involved in the different ministries and so on. We want to do that in partnership with others. So uh, it, it's been helpful to us to kind of work through these different elements of church. And, and what you've been talking about is to say that if we're going to be effective in our overall mission, we've got to have all of these different things working well and to, uh, to focus on these different things. And so for that reason, we've, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, yeah, that's your message, isn't it? We should organize purposely for, the, for doing these things. Um, tell us a bit about your, your, your experience of that and why that works and what that looks like. Because you've been talking about team pastors rather than just, well, I don't know, non-team pastors. Solo. Solo, yeah, or, or just uh, everybody doing a bit of everything. T t t tell us a bit about your thinking on that and how that's worked out in your, in your own sense. Yeah, look, um, uh, the reality is that healthy things grow and a body to be healthy has to have all its parts working. Most churches, though, operate with just two parts of the body working and the rest is sort of atrophied and dropped off or left and ignored. But there's a lot more in the body life of the Christian community that if we can get it all working well, then the body of Christ actually mobilizes and moves forward and makes a difference there's a sense in which churches are sleeping giants i mean sometimes they're not that big actually but you are a very significant group of people and um, sometimes churches are sleeping giants and if we can just if we can just get together and mobilize and get organized we could make a massive difference you could make a far bigger difference than you realize in this area and one of the ways to get organized is to pay attention to all the bits of the body that God intends to work well and make sure each bit works well. Now what we are talking about in terms of team pastoring is actually making sure you've got someone responsible for each part of church life ensuring that it does work well. Typically what happens in churches is that you put a pastor on his own in charge of a church or responsible for it and they, they only see two or three of that, that whole mix of body life. They only see two parts and they focus on those and the other parts just get left. The church stumbles along. But if you can make sure every bit is healthy and growing and vibrant, the church comes together and it's really quite powerful and we've seen that happen. So in our church experience, it's um, God has blessed the health of church life as a place where people are uh, are captivated by Christ and mobilised to be moving out and reaching their community and bringing their gifts to bear in all kinds of different areas and the whole thing has an energy about it that's captivating for people and they're drawn to see the thing, things of Christ. We've uh, been analysing the church like that and trying to, trying to uh, organise better. Uh, can you do the next one, Stephen? We've... Uh, organize ourselves in in these ways and are trying to make our, our ministry team focused on these on these particular areas um do you think that's going to help us be more effective really as a as a church as a whole some people will be skeptical because they'll say well what's really important is the word of god and prayer and uh, that's what i think i think the word of god and prayer at the heart of everything we're doing that's what we believe as a church but is this antithetical to that is this some people might say, well, is this some sort of new uh, you know, business strategy or something, uh, as opposed to this uh, real gospel ministry that God's doing? What would you say to somebody who's, who's a little worried about that or thinks, well, what's the point of all of this kind of reorganizing? Yeah, well, I, I'd say don't worry and we'll just get on and move forward, I think is the very short answer. But the, the longer answer is to draw attention to the fact that if the word of God is being preached, you, you remember that in the early church that the, the word of God went out and it caused a number of different things to happen. It, it went beyond just people learning new things. It went beyond just people knowing stuff. It actually caused them to gather together in community life and share with one another. It, it caused them to want to praise God and and delight in him and enjoy him it, it caused them to want to get about serving one another in ministry it caused them to want to evangelize their friends these are all different areas of church life that by the word of God and the spirit of God they were mobilized what what 
I want to offer is that um, sometimes in church life, we can preach the word uh, prayerfully and God brings some of those things to bear, but many of us are kind of hardened to lots of other parts that could be working. And if we just intentionally brought the word of God to bear to see all of those pieces happening, that we do gladly, joyfully rejoice in God, that we seek to grow in our obedience of God, that we seek all of those areas to happen in church life intentionally, then the whole body of Christ builds itself up as each part does its work. There's a, a bringing together of all the various gifts that, that make a richness to the experience of what it is to be a Christian that's captivating, that's beautiful, uh, that's empowering. You, you would, I'd be surprised if you've not, if you've been in churches before, I'd be surprised if you've not had the experience of being in a place that's strong, that's a church that's a real Bible teaching church, but it's a cool church, it doesn't have much relational engagement. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a Bible teaching church that has a real community life together where there's warmth and grace and generosity with each other? You've been in churches where there might be Bible teaching, but no one does much evangelism and mission. Imagine having a church with Bible teaching, community and mission and ministry training and development. People are growing in their service of one another. Imagine a church like that. If all of those bits were working, it would be extraordinary in its power to make a difference. And that's, that's all we're seeking to commend to people, is to get every part of church life healthy. And the way to do that? Get organised. You've got to get organised. You've got to be intentional. Yeah. It won't just happen except in periods of revival. Except, except in the early church, it, it spontaneously happened. But apart from a great movement of the Spirit, there's the need to be intentional and purposeful and push forward, yeah. We are thinking very quickly in the early church in Acts 6, having to get organised in all kinds of ways. Um, what so God does. Um, just one last thing. You've been with us uh, for a few days. You've uh, been with church. You've met other, other churches and so on. Uh, apart from the awful weather, uh, have you been encouraged? And what, what would you, would you have anything particular to say to us to, to encourage us to keep, to keep on? Yeah, look, I'd, yeah, I'd be very glad to say something. Um, I love some of your songs. Uh, some of them, uh, but some of them are... <laughs> <laughs> some of them are very good. Um, it, it, look, I have, I've been really encouraged to be with you. It's been... Uh, thank you for your welcome. Um, I, um, I, it's, 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 I'm on the other side of the planet, and I've never met... Well, I've met Willie a couple of years ago, but I've never met any of you. But what's remarkable is you can come from the other side of the planet and find a group of people who are reading the same Bible and captured by the same things and wanting to serve the same Lord. Isn't that exciting? And so I, I've found amongst you that same spirit and that's really encouraging. And I dare say that's because you've enjoyed faithful Bible teaching ministries led by people who are sincere in their faith and wanting genuinely to express a desire to follow God. I think you've you are blessed with a leadership, um, you know, with Willie, with the, but, but the broader leadership here is, is um, very encouraging. But I've got to say too, I find you I've been, I've felt the warmth from you as a community that's been quite, quite wonderful. And, and it seems to me that's not very British. I, I mean, I, I've been here quite a few times and usually very cool and reserved and a convicts amongst you and so you sort of, push them aside a little, um, but you've been very welcoming and very warm, which I think is evidence of a miraculous work of the Spirit. For a British community to be like you is evidence of the miraculous work of the Spirit. No, no, it has been delightful. It's been really, I, I've, um, I've really enjoyed being with you, and I, if I was in this part of the world, I would church with you. I don't know if that's of any merit for you, but there you are. Thanks, Andrew. Well, it's been great for us to have you. Do pray for Andrew. He's got another few days with us. Uh, he's going to be with our, some of our staff tomorrow and then Tuesday to Thursday with uh, a dozen or so other ministers from around, around the country who are coming for a, a residential time. So uh, do pray that that will be a, a, a valuable time for us and a, a further encouraging time for Andrew too. And uh, we will continue to remember you and to pray for you as you go back to Australia. Thank you.
That's great. Thank you so much for those encouragements, and it's been it's been great having you with us, Andrew. So thank you for coming all this way. All those hymns are on the website. You can find them on the website <laughs> when you're back in Australia. Yeah. Good. Well, let's sing again, and um, we're going to sing an ancient hymn, O Matchless Beauty of Our God, so ancient and so new. Kindle in us your fire of love, fall on us as the dew. Let's sing together. <coughs> turn now to God's Word and to the book of Psalms and to Psalm 119. Ed will just continuing his series uh, through the psalm. And we're in verses 65 to 72 this evening, page 513. Psalm 119 and reading from verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling, like fat. 
but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Amen. May the Lord bless to us his word this evening. We're now going to receive uh, the offering as the musicians play. Uh, perhaps just keep that psalm open in front of you and read through it, think on it, meditate on it. But uh, the offering will now be received. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the treasure store that is your word. And may we share forevermore the sweetness of that golden store and taste its rich reward and make the scriptures our delight and walk as pleasing in your sight our great Redeeming Lord, help us to that end, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before Edward comes to preach, we sing again the hymn that's on our screens. O God, who shaped the starry skies and made the sun in splendor rise. Let's sing.
Well, friends, let's turn in our psalm to verses 65 to 72, Psalm 119, and you'll find that on page 513 in our hardback Bibles. My title for this evening is The Blessings of Affliction. Now, you'll be aware that this great psalm falls into 22 sections, and each section has eight verses in it. And while there are various themes which are touched on many times throughout the psalm, in most of the sections there is not one dominant theme. But in our section for tonight, there is a dominant theme, and it's this theme of affliction. And throughout these eight verses, 65 to 72, our psalmist's main point is that it's good for him, and good, therefore, for any believer, to suffer affliction because affliction drives us to study the Bible and to value it deeply. Now, this is not a theme that the man or woman of the world wants to engage with. Human beings naturally put a great deal of effort into avoiding affliction. In fact, we devise all kinds of barriers and buffers to keep affliction far from us. If we're given the choice between comfort and affliction, we naturally go for comfort. The deck chair is more attractive than the gymnasium. But the Bible, in its length and breadth, teaches us that believers will suffer. It shows us that people who belong to the world to come will be put under pressure by people who belong to this world. To become a Christian is to join the ranks of people who prepare to suffer. Just think for a moment of the most prominent people in the Bible. Think of Moses, who led the people through the wilderness. He suffered. David, the king, was hounded by enemies. Daniel suffered. Job suffered. In the New Testament, the apostles suffered. And supremely, Jesus himself suffered. He was on earth a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And in the New Testament, the ordinary Christians suffer as well and are taught to expect it. For example, this is what Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 29 of that letter. He says, It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Now think of that verb there. It has been granted to you, gifted to you, that you should not only believe in Christ, but also suffer for his sake. Suffering for the sake of Christ is part of the package that we receive when we start to follow the Lord Jesus. <coughs> now, you might be sitting there thinking, I do not want to listen to this. Thank you. It's too difficult. Can I leave now and go to the pub? Friend, don't leave. Because our psalmist, as I think we'll see in a moment, is going to make the point that to be afflicted because of our allegiance to the Lord is a blessing. And it's the very thing that transforms us from men and women of the world into men and women of God. It is right at the heart of true Bible Christianity. A church that has no place in its understanding or its teaching for suffering and affliction can never be a true church of Jesus Christ. I have an excellent short exposition of Psalm 119 by Christopher Ashe, who used to be the director of the Cornhill Training Course in London. And I'd like to read you a short excerpt from his comments on this particular section of the psalm. He writes this. We now reach a most important section of the psalm, verses 65 to 72. We will call this section the adversity gospel, which is the antidote to the so-called prosperity gospel, which is no gospel. The prosperity gospel is endemic in Christianity all around the world. In one form or another, it teaches that if you become a Christian, God wants to bless you, <coughs> and therefore your bank statement will become fatter, your house will get bigger, your car will get faster, your wife will get prettier, or your husband more handsome, your children will get cleverer, your health will get better, and all will be for the best in this best of all possible religions. That is to say, 
things will necessarily get better in this life. Now, that is the teaching of the so-called prosperity gospel, but it is not the teaching of the Bible. It leads people astray, and we need to resist it. Our psalmist is teaching us that affliction is a necessary part of true Bible faith. Now, just to give a bit of bigger context to, to, to all this, let me just add this before we grapple with the text. The Lord does bless us with great joy, with many joys. Affliction is not the whole story. Just think of it. The Lord gives us the joys of creation, food, for example, and laughter and friendship, and the hobbies that we enjoy, like growing vegetables in the garden. He showers us with pleasures, sport, music, the arts, architecture, the sciences, the loveliness of hill and valley and springtime and birdsong, and the joys of belonging to his people as well. We had a touch of that from what Andrew was saying a few minutes ago. The joys of belonging to a group of people like this. Sometimes when I think of our church here at the Tron, I feel so glad and so blessed I could pick up the dog and dance a highland fling on the kitchen floor. I could, and it's a big dog. <laughs> there are great joys in being a Christian, great joys. Our psalmist as well is full of joy as well as affliction. Look at verse 35, for example. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Delight is a strong and visceral word. Or look at verse 64. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. The whole globe, all its teeming life, speaks of the rock-solid assurance of the loving promises of the God of Israel. And even this section on affliction, you have a joyful outburst here in verse 72. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. <clears throat> in other words, you can keep your bank full of money. I don't want it. I want the Bible because I value the Bible so much. So do bear all that in mind. That's the bigger context. The Lord blesses us with so many things and he gives us real joys. But let's now turn to our passage so as to consider the blessings of affliction. I want to draw two main ideas from the passage. The first will be much longer and the second much shorter. First then, affliction is our personal trainer. Verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Affliction has been a source of learning for me. What is it that I learn through affliction? Your statutes. In other words, affliction has opened up my understanding of the Bible. Now let's see what lies behind this important verse 71. Let's go back to verse 65 to see how our psalmist begins. He says to the Lord, you have dealt well with your servant. Now he's not saying you have dealt well with me, your servant, by protecting me from trouble. What he's saying is you have dealt well with me by allowing affliction to come to me. That's the point he's working towards. Verse 65, you've dealt well with me. And then look at verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted. But our friend the psalmist is a bit more specific in verse 65. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. So the Lord's goodness is shown in his keeping of his word or keeping his promises. He has promised to deal well with his servants. Throughout the Bible, he's promised again and again to be with his people, to bless his people, to be their very possession, their portion, as he puts it in verse 57, their eternal inheritance. And all his promises come to their fulfillment in the coming of Jesus to rescue his people for eternal life. The Lord has dealt well with the psalmist, and the Lord has dealt well with the church. He has dealt well, he is dealing well with the church, and he will ultimately deal well with his people. And the psalmist, knowing that the Lord has been utterly faithful to him, dares now to voice a request in verse 66. Teach me, he says, good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. 
Now that phrase, good judgment, literally means taste. He's saying to the Lord, please develop my taste for true knowledge and for moral goodness. Now you know how with uh, some foods, you have to develop an acquired taste. And it may be that by nature, we don't naturally have a taste for moral goodness. But think of this in terms of the things we eat. A 13-year-old who doesn't like to eat fish may well learn to enjoy fish by the time he's 20. He acquires the taste for it. And the Christian may not initially have much of a taste for moral goodness, but God in his grace develops in us a longing to be able to live in such a way as to please him. How then does the Lord sharpen a believer's desire for good judgment and knowledge? How does he whet our appetite for these things? The answer is by allowing us to be afflicted. This is the line of thinking that takes us from verse 66 to 67. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. And how is it, verse 67, that I'm now keeping your word? It is through affliction. I was off the right path. I was astray before I was afflicted. But now, he's saying, following my time of affliction, I'm keeping your word. And he puts it even more clearly in verse 71. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So our afflictions school us and train us in learning what the Bible really means. Without them, we would never really deeply understand the scriptures. To follow Jesus is going to follow in the same pattern that he has set for us. We mark his footsteps and in them plant our own, as the old hymn puts it. Now, what are his footsteps? Well, his pattern is that he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we learn to be like him. Christians are being conformed, reshaped to the image of God's Son. And in Jesus' own experience, there had to be death before there could be resurrection. And it's the same with us. The Bible teaches us to look at our sorrows and afflictions, not as the world looks at them. The world regards these things as 100% hateful and 100% to be avoided. But that is not the Bible's way. Just think of how the New Testament deals with this subject. Think of the Apostle James writing in the first chapter of his letter. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. But he goes on to give the reason for these trials. For he says, you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Our trials are like an arduous form of training. They develop our ability to endure, to persevere. Or think of the Apostle Paul, who writes this in Romans chapter 5. We rejoice in our sufferings. Isn't that a way to start a sentence? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. The letter to the Hebrews picks up the same line of teaching in its 12th chapter. The author writes, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, in other words, his real genuine sons. For what son is there whom his father has not disciplined? Then the author goes on. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, these Bible authors are not telling us to laugh when we're struck with trauma and affliction. Certainly not. Our afflictions will make us weep. We will feel numbed by them, initially perhaps deeply discouraged by them, and sometimes quite overwhelmed by them. When James the Apostle says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various kinds of trials, he's asking us to think of our lives as being like a great ledger, a great account book, where on one side you record your losses, and on the other side you record your assets and your profits. And he's saying to us, Consider your trials, account your trials as assets and profits, not as losses. The world will see them as losses. 
But you, my brothers, James is saying, you must learn to consider your sufferings as great assets in the end. Count them as joy. They're not enjoyable, but regard them as experiences of great benefit to your life as a Christian. These New Testament authors are showing us that afflictions develop our powers of endurance. And our psalm focuses that endurance even more sharply by showing us that affliction enables us to endure in keeping God's word. Look again at verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And how does the psalmist speak of God's part in all this? Well, look at verse 65 again. You have dealt well with your servant. And verse 68, you are good and you do good. In other words, the afflictions he's been suffering are an expression of God's love and God's goodness towards him. They're not a sign that God hates him or that God has abandoned him. On the contrary, they're a sign that God loves him and has his best interests at heart. Let me ask this question. Did God love Jesus when he gave him up to death on the cross? Was that a loving thing for a father to cause his son to do? Of course he was loving Jesus at that point. The cross is the highest expression of God's love, not only for us, but also for Jesus. The suffering of the cross was inescapable. God's love was not suddenly withdrawn from his son, when Jesus went onto the cross. It was the sin of man, our sin, that caused the death of Jesus and made it necessary. And it was the loving suffering of Jesus backed by the loving sending of God the Father. It was that that brought about our salvation. And in the same way, it's the love of God that lies behind our afflictions. We would never have understood that without the Bible's teaching. Without the Bible's teaching, we would rail against our sufferings. We'd cry out, it's cruel, it's unfair. But with the Bible to instruct us, we can learn to say, in the words of verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted. Now, the Lord will allow afflictions to come to us in many different forms. There'll be bereavements, there'll be severe illnesses, unexpected unemployment and lack of funds, financial crash, family problems and broken relationships, for some people exhaustion and overwork, then there'll be the inevitable decline in health and vigor that old age brings on. But the Lord lovingly allows these things to come to us so that, in the words of verse 71, we might learn the Lord's statutes, that we might come to him and cling to him in our difficulties. Do you remember the example of Job? Think of what his sufferings did to him. Well, let me remind you of his sufferings first. In one day, in a single day, this godly, fine, upright man lost all his livestock, all his servants, bar the one or two who brought the message of his losses to him, and all ten of his ten children, all of them, as the house collapsed on them. And then very soon afterwards, the Lord allowed Satan to take Job's health away, and he was afflicted from head to foot with painful sores. And he had to sit outside in the garden on the ash heap, scraping these painful sores with a piece of broken pot to try and give him some relief. Now, you might have expected Job at that point to curse God and turn away from him and never want to speak to him again. But no, Job turned to the Lord and clung to him and talked with him and argued with him and was finally blessed by him enormously. One of the great lessons of the book of Job is to teach us to turn to the Lord and not away from the Lord when affliction comes to us, to cling to him for better or for worse. Now, our psalmist here reacts to his afflictions in just the same way. He prays, he opens his Bible, and he begins to study his Bible as he has never studied it before. It is good for me that I was afflicted, verse 71. Why? That I might learn your statutes. Now, friends, to illustrate this, <clears throat> if you've been with us at the Tron for less than the last seven years or so, 
you may not know much about what happened to our church back in 2012 and the years that led up to it. But it was in that year that we left the Church of Scotland, the national church to which our congregation had belonged for a very long time. We left the denomination. It was a time of real affliction and real difficulty for us. Now, as most of you will know, the issue on the surface, on the surface, was the fact that the Church of Scotland was failing to hold to the Bible's teaching on human sexuality. It was beginning to say very clearly that homosexual relationships could be actively engaged in by Christians, including Christian ministers and church leaders. That was the surface issue. But underlying that issue, the more important issue, was the question, is the Bible really authoritative? We know that the Bible's teaching on sex and marriage and sexuality is absolutely clear. Sex uh, is for marriage, and marriage is for one man and one woman. So we realized that the Church of Scotland was having to decide whether its practice was going to be determined by the Bible or by the agenda of the modern world. And the Church of Scotland at that point decided to abandon the Bible's teaching and to opt for the way of the world. Now for us at the time, it was obvious that if we wanted to honor the Lord and honor the Bible, we had to leave the denomination. But it was not easy. It brought real affliction. There were tears. There was anger. There was frustration. There was a great deal of pain. But that crisis, that affliction, had the effect of forcing our noses back into the Scriptures. We had to ask ourselves at that time, well, what does the Bible teach about these things? So the denomination, without doing so knowingly, was challenging the Tron Church on what it really believed about the Bible. But those of us who were there at the time, as we look back on that painful period, we would all echo the words of verse 71. It is good for us that we were afflicted, that we might learn the Lord's statutes. Our conviction that the Bible is true and authoritative and decisive in these ethical matters has been greatly strengthened by our affliction. We had to study the Bible afresh, and our convictions were greatly strengthened by our study. Now think of how this might work out on the individual level, on the individual Christian life level. Many in the church, many in our church here, are young adults. There are students, young workers. Perhaps you're, you're married and you're raising a young family, in which case you may not feel like a young adult anymore. You may be feeling a bit like a harassed adult with middle age fast encroaching. But I'm thinking particularly of those of you who are in your 20s and 30s. There was a time, perhaps, when you sat rather loose to the Bible. You were spreading your wings. You were enjoying the thrills and spills of youth and not bothering your minds much with the Bible. And even if you professed to being a Christian, you weren't very serious about the Bible. But time has moved on, and you've seen some rough patches in life. Your little ship has encountered choppy waters. And here you are now, you're in the congregation. You have begun to take the Bible much more seriously. And you know how people begin to challenge you colleagues at work, if you're out at work, or fellow students at the university. And you get, you get questions like this fired at you. How can you folk believe that the Bible is relevant after all these centuries? It was written 3,000 years ago. Or how can Jesus be the only way to God? This is a cosmopolitan world. We have to accept everything, don't we? How can Jesus be the only way? So questions of this kind get fired at you and they are painful. They bring you affliction. Not perhaps major affliction, but real affliction. But in the face of these questions, as you take a stand for the Bible and for the Christian faith, the very fact that you're standing up and taking the criticism fortifies you to be brave in the future. Every time you say, well, I do believe that the Bible is true, or I do believe that Jesus is unique and is the only way to God, or I do believe in the ethical teaching of the Bible, every time you take courage and stand firm on the Bible's teaching, you set yourself a personal precedent. You strengthen your own spine. Look back to verse 67. 
before I was afflicted, before suffering came my way, I was careless. I was all over the place. I was going astray. But now, since I've begun to taste affliction, I keep your word. My character as a believer is being formed and strengthened. Now, verses 69 and 70 paint a rather chilling picture of one particular source of affliction. And that source is people who are clearly anti-God and anti-the psalmist. Let me read those two verses, 69. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. Verse 69 speaks of what we would call a smear campaign, where a person's reputation is dishonored by lies being told about them. Now, this is a pretty common experience for Christian leaders uh, in, a most pr in prominent positions. Somebody hates their work, hates their gospel, hates the influence that they're having for the gospel, and accuses them without justification of some kind of misbehavior. Well, it's a comfort to know that this happened to Jesus. Think of some of the things that were said against him. He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He was called a deceiver, a blasphemer, a Sabbath breaker, a man who is leading the people astray. He was smeared with lies. But the truth was, verse 69, that he kept the Lord's precepts with his whole heart. What happens to these people who oppose those who stand for the truth? Well, look at verse 70. Their hearts become like a bowl of fat. In other words, they lose all, all sensitivity. Their consciences are dulled. But the psalmist, by contrast, delights in the law of God. So friends, there's the first thing. And let's rejoice at it. Affliction is our personal trainer. It's very painful. But when affliction comes, it drives us not away from the Bible, but into the Bible. It is good for me that I was afflicted, says the psalmist, that I might learn your statutes. Well, now secondly, and much more briefly, affliction causes us to value God's words immensely. Let's look together at verse 72. It's a very joyful verse. The law of your mouth is better to me, more valuable to me, than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Now, the strength of this verse hangs upon the fact that the human heart naturally craves money. The psalmist knows this. And it's that craving that gives force to this verse. He imagines opening a strong box that is full of money, or perhaps going into some kind of Aladdin's cave that is crammed full of glittering pieces of silver and gold. And as he looks at all this shiny metal, or all these banknotes, he says, poof, what a load of trash that is. There is only one thing that I want, and that is the words of God. Because the words of God teach me how to live, teach me how to make sense of my life with all its afflictions. Money can never do that. Money can only coarsen me and corrupt me, make my heart like fat, become a lifeless idol. That's what money does. But God's words teach me how to live, how to die, and what to value. And they teach me about him and how much he loves me. Verse 72 teaches us the real value of the Bible. And look at the delightful way that the psalmist describes the Bible in verse 72. Not as the Bible, but as the law of your mouth. Isn't that personal? These are not cold words inscribed on marble tablets. This is the father instructing his child gently and lovingly. He speaks to his child mouth to ear. And why is the teaching of God's mouth so precious? Because the psalmist has been afflicted and the Lord is reassuring him that it is good to be afflicted. For me personally, I've known very little real affliction in my life. But there was a time when I was in my late 30s when I was suddenly struck down with what the doctors called chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm sure there are others who have had a similar thing uh, in my late 30s. As I say, now I don't know why this came to me. I have never been a workaholic. But I was suddenly reduced to a shadow of my former self. And for months, I could barely do anything. I could just manage one or two little tasks per day. Write a short letter, 
pick up a bucket of chicken feed and feed the chickens. I can do that. Just a few, a few small things. Anyway, one particular day, I'd managed to write a short letter to somebody, and I had to go and post it. So I walked, I tottered slowly to the post box, which was about two or 300 yards away from where we lived. This involved crossing a little bridge over a very pretty little stream that ran underneath. And as I approached the bridge, I noticed a man that I knew looking over it into the water. I don't mean he was thinking of diving off the edge, not like that, but he was just looking at it. He was an Irishman not called Paddy Ryan. <coughs> he was about 30 years older than I was. And he'd recently had a leg amputated. He was a heavy smoker. I think he was still smoking as he looked over the bridge. You know, he'd had uh, vascular trouble. Anyway, he wasn't at all well, but I knew him a little bit. So I stopped and I said, hello, Paddy, and how are you? At the top of the morning to you, Vicar, he said, I could be worse. I could be worse. I'm still on the green side of the turf. Anyway, we had a little chat together. But the point I'm making is this. As we leaned over the bridge and looked at the water together, I suddenly realized that physically I was on exactly the same level as this man who didn't really have very long to live. I felt that we were two little old men tottering and pottering. I was 38 and I felt like Methuselah. Now, it was a minor affliction, as it turned out. It lasted just a year or so, and I got better. But it made me realize that we're attached to this world by a fragile thread. A very small pair of scissors can snip it. Affliction brings home to us our powerlessness. When we're well and happy and confident, we surge through life like a bull in a china shop. But when we're reduced to fragility, we realize that it's the Bible, it's the words of God's mouth that bind us to the world to come. It's when we're really up against it that we value the glorious gospel, these promises of eternal life, the promise that we shall be with the Lord and the Lord's people forever in that realm where tears, pain, mourning, and death have vanished. So when afflictions come to us, let's not rail against them. They may be desperately painful, but these afflictions will train us to value the Lord and his words. And we shall be able to say with the psalmist, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And does affliction teach me the Bible just for my own benefit? No, it teaches me the Bible so that I can then share the wonderful gospel with the needy world outside who so much need to hear it too. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. How we thank you, our dear Heavenly Father, for loving us and for leaning over and speaking into our ears from your own wonderful mouth the words that you want us to hear, the words that assure us that you are for us, not against us, and that when you allow afflictions to come to us, it is ultimately for our benefit. Give us the grace, we pray, to understand this and to stick with you, to turn with you every time some sharp affliction comes to us, not to take offense at it, but to learn to consider it as an asset and a profit, not as a loss, so that we might know you better cling to you more, and understand this great and glorious gospel of eternal life. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to sing together again. And uh, our final hymn, I've chosen this one. We often sing it on Good Friday, but I thought I, we would sing it tonight because it takes us into the, the pain and the anguish and the affliction that Jesus himself suffered and helps us to feel at least a little bit of what he went through. So let's sing together, O Sacred Head.
some words from Hebrews as we finish. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep us, we pray, dear Father, firm in this faith. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.